All right, well, let's go ahead and get started because as I promised, it's 201 and we got lots to talk about. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kelly Lippincott and I work for ProMedica Senior Care. I help organize the virtual events for our Art and Courts product, which includes the one that we're hosting today. I hope that there'll be a time sometime soon where we can all get together in person. But for right now, we're gonna have to go ahead and do the next best thing, which is virtually, so you get to see our little boxes like Brady Bunch, like we are now. I always, uh, the Brady Bunch always comes up for me. Um, so, uh, it feels a lot taller than me in real life, which you <laughs> wouldn't know if we were just standing here on Zoom, but in fact, Rachel is significantly taller than me. Kelly, I don't remember about you, whether you're taller or shorter, but I know Rachel's a lot taller. Oh, I'm average, so probably not. But um, I want to go ahead and let you know that today we're going to be utilizing the chat function of Zoom because we have so many people joining us today. The chat function is if you take your scroll down to the bottom of the screen, it is in the middle of the screen with a little thought bubble around it. Just click on that and you'll see a white box that appears to the side. Um, we're going to be using that for the question and answer session will be at the end of the session today so that we could get as much information from TIFA as possible. Then we'll do the question and answer. Just make sure that you have all panelists and attendees indicated at the bottom of the chat box, not just a panelist or only we will see it, not everybody. Um, the question and answer will be open forum, so we're going to try to get to as many as time will allow us to get to. So if we don't get to your question, I apologize in advance. But what I will say is that this webinar will be recorded today so that if you do miss any portion of the webinar, what we'll do is we'll send you an email a couple of days after the event with the link to the webinar so that you can rewind or stop or review any portion of today's webinar anytime you want. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our speaker today, which is Ms. Tifa Snow. Ms. Snow is the world leading advocate and educator in the field of dementia. She's an occupational therapist with over 40 years of rich and varied clinical and academic experience. Her knowledge about dementia led her to the development of the GEMS dementia classification model and the positive approach to care training strategies. Her company, Positive Approach LLC, was founded in 2006 and offers person-centered training opportunities in the United States, Canada, Australia, and the UK. Awesome. Uh, TIPA's user-friendly approaches provides guidance and leadership for uh, professionals, caregivers. I mean, she just presents information that is a very easy to understand. She has many fans, including me, and so I love it every time she comes and talks to us. But um, also joining us today from TIPA's company is Rachel Volkers, who is that way, and she will be assisting TIPA uh, periodically throughout the seminar or webinar. I'm sorry. Uh, so without further ado, let me not take any more of the time. Let me go ahead and uh, introduce Rachel and Tifa. Welcome. Thank you, Kelly. Hey, everybody. We are very glad to be with you, even though it's sort of pretend, but we're glad you're here and we're glad to be here. So our topic for today is this question about why, why do they do that? I mean, why does somebody living with dementia do that? And it has a lot to do with a variety of things. And I'm going to cover some of the reasons things happen the way they do. Number one, the number one reason I'm giving you a thumbs up is that parts of their brain still work. So that's the good news is sometimes they do what they do because parts of their brain are still working. Take your index finger. Sometimes they do what they do because parts of their brain are not working. So it's a combination of sometimes there are things that still work and there are things that are no longer working. And that no longer working, do this with your finger, it comes and it goes. And so what that means is when it's gone, they can't. And when it comes back online for a short window of time or maybe a while or maybe just a second, suddenly they can. And so this function of the brain working and not working, that's sort of a hallmark of dementia because dementia is not something that like a stroke where you have a stroke and boom, it's gone. What happens is the wiring in the brain is sort of fritzy before it stops working. And so it's sort of like the light that has that flicker going on. And sometimes you can get it to work, sometimes you can't, there's a dimmer switch. And so what this means is it's, it, it, it <laughs> put your hand up on your forehead if you want. 
if you're not careful, you will lose out. You're not a loser, but you will lose out on opportunities if you keep wanting what you can't have and you keep expecting what someone can't do. If we get better at noticing what they still can do and when things are working or when they're not, then we can make some changes because the third thing that quite honestly impacts why people do what they do, take your middle finger and point it to you, is us and how we behave, what we say, what we, we think, how we act, how we, we react, how we respond to someone, how we modify or change a situation. So we make a big difference but it's in combination with what they've lost and what they still have that we can make a big difference. And fortunately, if we think it's all about them and us, what we'll end up with is not a good relationship because it's a hit and miss sometimes. Now, a couple other things that affect why people do what they do, the environment, where someone is, who's around them, what's going on there. So we talk about the environment and that has to do with people and what's happening in the environment, but also the physical environment and the sensory environment. So what they see or what they don't see, what they hear, what they don't hear, what's happening, what's not happening, the space, is it familiar, is it unfamiliar? And then the last thing that makes a difference in why people frequently do what they do is time of day because it matters. Some of us are much better at one time a day than another, and so that makes a difference. But the other thing, along with time of day, is where, where I think I am in a time of day. So it's not just where I'm really in a time of day. Where do I think I am? Do I know where I am? And that, again, goes back to brain what's working and what's not. So I'm going to dig into this a little bit more, but right away, I hope what you're getting is I can't give you a, they do this because, period. It means that it's a complicated situation. So each individual who's living with dementia is going to look a little unique. Each kind of dementia is going to be a little different. And each situation can vary. So guess what? We're going to have to be really flexible if we want to be supportive and we want to be able to handle things well. And the problem is, yikes, sometimes we come into this with expectations based on who people used to be and we're having a hard time adapting and adjusting. So what I'm going to do now is show you a few slides because sometimes it's helpful to take a look at information and I will share a little bit of slides. I'm also going to share a couple of videos. So what my goal for people is to help them understand normal versus not normal. Okay, so that's the first step. And notice I didn't say normal versus dementia. I just said normal versus something that isn't so normal. So normal aging. As we get a little older, we slow down. Now, the amount of slowing down is about 0.01% to 0.1% per year. So if I started slowing down at about age 25, which is about what happens, we peak at somewhere you're the fastest you will ever be. Your brain is the quickest you will ever, your reaction times are the best they will ever be at about age 25 or so. And after that, we slow down a little bit. Now, if we keep in shape, it's a minimal slowdown, but over the course of let's say 50 years, which means if I was 25, what am I now? Let's see if y'all can do the math. And I'm not gonna give you the answer till y'all chip in. So how old would I be if it had been 50 years and I started at 25? Rachel, what do we got? This is where you have to chat the answer, guys. Kay said 70, oh again, 75. 75, there you go. Woo, math 101, good job. So if I were 75 years old, I may have changed up to 5% speed-wise. So if you compared me to how I was at 25, you would definitely notice at 75, whoa, I'm a little slower. I may be slower taking in data, processing data, doing things. Uh, I'm a little slower in my thinking. But the other thing that's reality is that I'm more likely to want to hesitate a little bit. 
before I commit to doing something. Because over that 50 years, I've had life. And life teaches you, whoa, hang on, take a look before you go through that stop sign. Whoa, look a second time before you give somebody money. Be careful. You may not want to get up on the ladder and get the leaves out of the gutter when you haven't made sure that somebody's around just in case. I mean, so you've learned a little caution with that 50 years of living. People who don't learn any caution sometimes don't make it through 50 years. But as we put together a 25-year-old and a 75-year-old, what we can find is because our sense of time is a little bit different uh, and how quickly we can do things, we can have some conflict just over, I mean, come on, Grandma, let's just get going. And it's like, don't push me. I'll do it when I'm ready. What that means is, if we're going to work with people, even without dementia who are getting older, we need to take a deep breath and pause so that they have that extra time when I want to have a conversation. Hey, Rachel. Yes. I was wondering, mm -hmm. do you like something hot to drink during the winter or do you like something cold to drink? Well, it depends. It depends. Okay, so that was an example of slowing down and, and taking it easy. Hey, Rachel, what do you want to drink? Because I can get you a hot drink or a cold drink and I just really want to know which one you'd rather have because whichever one, now I don't have any soda, but what I do have is I have some things that I could put ice in. <laughs> and again, I'm not trying to be ornery about it, but if my brain works really quick and your brain is not as quick, we're at risk for having conflict. I want to point out, this is all normal aging, though. This is normal. We also may find that as we get older, it is much more challenging to be able to accurately come up with somebody's name quickly. We know who they are. We recognize them. We can think of often of the first letter of their name. And it's like, son of a gun, what's the author of that book? Um, Oh, shoot. What was that? And, and so we find ourselves, particularly names are our challenge and proper nouns. Also, we have to hesitate. It takes us much longer. But one of the reasons we know that happens, quite honestly, is because we have more words in our vocabulary system than we've ever had in our life. We keep gaining vocabulary. We have more names, more people, more, more details, and we can't hold on to everything. That's a reality check about getting older. And it's not that we're not trying, it's that it's harder for us to lay down new pathways that we can access again. So it's called, we get a little more forgetful. In other words, it's harder for us to get things to stick unless we make extra effort. Now, when we make the extra effort, we can get it to happen, but it doesn't automatically stick like it did when we were 25, which is a little frustrating if you're trying to learn something new like a language or remembering what I wanted to get at the grocery store and what I needed to, and then you get back home and you realize, oh shoot, I totally forgot to stop by the gas station. Ugh. Anybody ever done that on this call? <clears throat> seeing as how I was just at the checkout line and went, oh shoot, breadcrumbs. <sighs> and I had just said to myself, I need to remember to pick up breadcrumbs. And I got to the checkout and I was just putting the card in when I went, you didn't get breadcrumbs, did you? Uh-uh. Now, that was just a conversation I had with myself, but it's frustrating when that happens. Now, not normal means that I'm not thinking things through like I used to. So I, my judgment may be different, my thinking through, I don't see why I shouldn't get up on the ladder. I mean, if I fall, I fall. If I break my neck, I break my neck. Well, what if you break your hip? Well, I won't, I mean, it'll be fine. And so I'm just not thinking things through. I'm not processing the same. I may not be able to do things the way I used to. So I used to be able to drive the car and make left-hand turns with good judgment across two lines of oncoming traffic. Now, 
I'm either cutting in front of people or I'm sitting there and I can't seem to get myself ready to go because I keep worrying about whether the car is coming too fast. And so I go through three lights and I'm still not turning. Maybe I'm having trouble staying in my lane. Maybe I'm having, I mean, so you start to notice what is going on here? This is different than she usually does stuff. I either can't get going or once I get going on something, I can't seem to let it go. So it's called I either pay too much attention to something or I can't get my brain engaged in something. So that could be that I'm sorting things, sorting, sorting, sorting. And you say, well, come on, let's have dinner. No, I've got to get this done. And it's like, well, you've been working on it for two hours. I know that. Just And so what you might also notice is what else about me? What else might come up as a not normal aging phenomena? I knew that word. What did you notice besides that I was having a hard time letting go of sorting? Switching gears. We're hearing anger. Yeah, I have a hard time controlling emotion. So my emotions may be on a short leash. And so all of a sudden, boom, and it's like, whoa, but it may not be anger. It could be, um, why didn't you call me? I thought you were gonna call me. I got really worried. I thought you'd been in an accident. You're thinking, why would you think I was in an accident? Well, because you didn't call. Well, I just forgot. Well, why do you do this? So in that case, what did you notice? It wasn't anger. <laughs> what emotion is that one? Worry or anxiety? Worry or anxiety. Yeah. So you hear somebody's like, whoa, what is going on there? I mean, she worries about everything. She's bringing up stuff. It's like, that's not even reasonable. The combination of judgment and distress when I can't figure things out, when things don't go the way I anticipate. So we may also have the problem where I look at you and man, I cannot think of where I know you from. And yet you are in the very similar place to where I usually see you doing what you usually do there. And I am doing what I usually do there. This isn't the case where somebody from the faith community shows up at work and you're like, huh, I know I know you, but um, what are you doing here? And it takes, I mean, it's my brain is going, whoa, wrong place, wrong person. That's normal. That's a little like, whoa, hang on here. Let me figure this out. But it's really looking at you and thinking, oh, they hired somebody new at work. She looks familiar. Huh, have you, have you worked here before? Yeah, but it's Rachel. We, I, I mean, we've worked together for a long time. Oh, Rachel, huh. Rachel, you remember me? Yeah, yeah, of course I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rachel, uh-huh, Rachel. Huh. Yeah, so what, yeah, we've worked what, together for a long time. What kind of stuff did you do? Well, we did a lot of uh, teaching stuff together. Oh, teaching. Oh, so you're a teacher. Well, not as much as you. Oh, well, you know, but you're, you're, that's because you probably taught younger kids or something. Okay, so what do you notice my brain is starting to do now? So that's the other sort of thing that's not normal. What did you notice I started doing? Yeah, filling in the blanks or filling in the gaps. Yeah, and we call that confabulating. My brain fills in the blank information with fake information. It's not accurate, but my brain says, oh, I bet I can explain that. And so some people go, that's, I don't know what you're doing here. I don't even know who you are. And they become very standoffish, but other people will go, oh yeah. And their brain says, oh yeah, she must be somebody you know. But what I'm saying, your brain goes, that doesn't really make sense. What is she talking about, younger people? We used to do role play on webinars and my brain is not able to take in and accurately get to the right data. So the other, um, Situ not it's start of figment, not figment. The other um, situation, well, the other situation that happens is when I go to find the whatchamacallit, the things that you say, you know what I'm talking about, the things you say, I can't find the one that it is. And so I, I 
I sort of have to do another, you know, another thing. And then it sort of, it's, so it's not that bad at first, except every, except when then I get um, either just shut up, I get angry or I get anxious, then I can't find words. And you'll notice that, woo wee, I can get loud, but I'm not necessarily making a lot of sense. And the other not normal thing is I start get turning, getting turned around about time. Um, well, that just, well, I just, I just took a shower. I just had one. I think I must have dandruff. And in fact, you say, no, it's been like at least three weeks, I think, since you had a shower. No, I just took one. So, I mean, it could be about immediate <clears throat> activities or it could be more, I think I'm younger than I was, or I could think that I just lose time. So I think I took my pills this morning. I think, so I'm turned around on time. Now, all of these things that I've just described do indicate something's not normal, but they don't necessarily mean that the person has a form of dementia. So dementia, on the other hand, it is not normal. So it is not part of normal aging. It is a disease process. It is also more than just being forgetful. Being forgetful is normal. Having dementia, mm -mm, that is not normal. Eventually, if you do develop a dementia, you will not be able to be independent. Um, no matter how hard you try, you will not be able to live independently. Eventually, dementia will change pretty much your entire brain in some form or fashion, in some way, and it spreads through the brain. So by, by spreading through the brain, it also changes how your body works, how your brain runs your body, what your body is going to be able to do, because your body can only do what it does because your brain informs it and, and guides it and directs it. We also know <clears throat> that dementia is not something somebody can control. So although it sometimes feels like she's doing this on purpose, in fact, mm -mm, if it's dementia, she's not doing it on purpose. She's doing it because of what's working in her brain and what's not working in her brain. And how we're doing things in the environment and what's, what's going on time-wise. So that's tricky, but the other bad news is it's not going to be the same for every person. So just because I've had an experience with my mom, and then if my husband develops dementia, if I'm expecting him to be like my mom, I could be in for a real surprise. And if I have my husband who has dementia, and then I develop dementia, it could be a very different dementia. So this gets a little tricky. And the reality is when somebody gets dementia, they don't have a mental illness. However, if they get dementia, they're more at risk for anxiety and depression. But they also will tell you, I will tell you that if they have anxiety or depression as a condition, they're more likely to develop dementia than people who don't have mental health conditions. And it is very real. So what we know is it's really hard sometimes. So there are four things that are true about it, every form of dementia that we know about. Number one, at least two parts of your brain are actively dying. And one of them will be somehow related to memory. The second thing we know is that we can't fix it. We can't cure it. We can't uh, make it go away and we can't even stop it. So the third thing that's true is, is progressive. It is going to progress. Now how fast and where it goes next in your brain vary by dementia and by situation. Ultimately, dementia is a terminal illness. It is more for sure than with any other health condition, if nothing else takes you, dementia will eventually kill you because it destroys so much of your brain that your body can't operate because your brain isn't telling it what to do and how to do it, including things like breathing, swallowing, um, sleeping, waking, the ability to fight infections, the ability to move. All those things are controlled by our brain. So what I'm gonna show you are some fairly significant pictures. So what we're looking at are two men's brains and the man's, the brain on your left is from a man who died in an accident with a perfectly healthy brain when he died. Now, both of these men were in their late 70s, 78, 79, right in that ballpark. So they were the same age. They actually had the same measurement around their skulls 
and they were the same they were the same physical size so if i say that your head is the same size you're the same age and you have the same body build what would you tend to think about the brains and we're looking at the surface the cortex the surface of the brain the gentleman over here died with a perfectly normal brain he was in an accident when he died this person died at the end of Alzheimer's disease, which is a particular type of dementia, a very common one. What do you notice about the differences between the two brains? What's different between the two? So right off, someone said the size, you have size and color, smaller in gaps, much smaller, very much smaller. Cool. So what do you notice is the same? Ah, uh, Susan said the shape. Ah, so the structures are still there, but they don't look as healthy. They look sort of shriveled up, and you're absolutely accurate. So what if I were to tell you that the brain over on the right-hand side is only one-third the size as the one over on the left? How many of you would go, oh, well, it's not that much smaller? How many of you are surprised that it's only one third the size, given what you can see? I mean, it definitely looks smaller, but it's one third the original size by the time people die. Getting quite a few surprises and uh, wows. Yeah. So what happens is, and I'm going to show you this, the brain shrinks from the inside and from the outside. So we're looking on the outside of the brain and how much it shrinks, but it also shrinks on the inside because literally your brain cells our bodies with arms and legs and so many arms and legs, I can't imitate that. But what happens is when they develop dementia, they start shriveling up, shrinking up and dying. Now, when they do that, they literally pull away further from one another. And so that's why you see this. It looks like it's actually been dried out. And in fact, there are brain cells that have all shrunken up. But here's the part that's true. One third of your brain is still working. It just so happens that one third isn't enough to run you. And so truly dementia is at this point, the fifth leading cause of death for people over the age of 65. <clears throat> but many people do not realize it's the 11th leading cause of death for all age groups. So if we put all the age groups together, dementia is number 11 on the list of all things that could kill you. Dementia is right on up there for all ages. And people quite young can die from dementia and people quite old from, can die from dementia. So what we wanna do now, I'm gonna actually show you, if we were to make a cut right across here, like we were to slice, to put your hands on top of your, your head a little bit, like toward the front, so I'm gonna stand in profile so you can see, and you slice down, and now you take that front part of your brain and you pull it away so you're looking at the inside of your brain, but the front part of your brain, so this part right here. Only what we're gonna do, and this part right here, is we are actually going to look at it from the inside. Now, when you look at the top brain, that's that healthy brain, you'll see a lot of what's called white matter, and gray matter. White matter is the white looking stuff and the gray matter is the brown looking stuff. <clears throat> and the white matter is the wiring, things that wire parts of your brain together and wire your brain to your body. And the dark colored gray matter are the storage units where you put things, where you have the, the sort of storage units where stuff gets stored in your brain. So you need storage units, which is the gray, and then you need white matter, which is the wiring to get the information in and out. So if you look at this brain up here and you look at this one down here, what do you notice as really, really changing? We have no more wiring. We have far less white matter. Little to no white matter. Yeah. So if you don't have any wiring, does it matter what you have in storage? 
you're not going to be able to get to it. But if you have a little bit of wiring, guess what can happen sometimes? I can get to the storage unit, but I may not be able to get something out. Now remember, this is the very end of dementia. So on average, it's going to take 10 to 12 years to go from that fully functional, all that white matter, down to this is all that's left. Now, depending on the type of dementia you have, this part of your brain can be attacked early or it could be attacked later. This part of your brain called the prefrontal cortex or the executive control center has six jobs. Six. The very first job it has, take your hands, put them out and go, whoa. Go ahead and say that, whoa. This is the part of your brain that allows you to have impulse control. It says, uh, 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 don't eat that cookie. Remember you're diabetic. Uh -uh, don't say that. That's mean. <laughs> Tifa, mm -mm, that's a yellow light. Pause. It's the thing that allows me to be the person I want to be, not to act impulsively. So it allows me to control me and to present me to you as I want to be. It allows me not to say things. It keeps me from doing things. It allows me to do things that might be uncomfortable, but they're important to me. The second thing that the front of my brain does, so first is impulse control. The second one, take your hand, put it to the very back of your brain. That's where you put all your visual data that you take in, called your occipital lobe. Take your hands, touch your temples. That's where you put everything that you hear or auditory data. Now take your hands and spread them over the top of your head. Spread them out way far. This is all the sensory motor. This is the body brain connection. So what happens is this is the part of your brain. You send all that data that you took in through vision, hearing, and sensation and movement, and you send it to the front of your brain, send it to the front. And this part of your brain is what allows you to be reasonable, logical, and rational with all that data. So I looked over and I saw this purple container. Now, when you look at this purple container, when I show it to you, what, what do you notice? Because that's what this, this system is letting you do. When I ask you this question, the front of your brain is what is allowing you to understand what I said, get you to look at this. And when I say, what did you notice? Your brain is now working on that information. What do you come up with? People are noticing that it had liquid inside. It has liquid in it. Now, if you had to best guess, what do you think this liquid might be? People think it's water. Yeah, but uh, what if, what if, what if, what if I was sounding like this and moving like that? What you would think we vodka. You guys are thinking vodka or tequila. Yeah, because we pick up a rum, I guess, but you can't smell it if you were closer to me. Now, what happens in the front of your brain is your brain tries to make sense of the data. And so being reasonable, logical, and rational. Now, most of you would not first guess that what I have in this container is going to be vodka. Unless you know something about me that many people don't, I mean, not very likely. It's hard to do webinars when you drink that much. What's the more likely explanation for many people? Why would there be water in this? So this is being logical and rational and you're thinking this through. Why would I have water in this container? So Laura said to drink from, someone else said dry throat, the way you are talking, you get thirsty, it helps your vocal cords hydrate. Yeah. Why did I have it here versus somewhere else for this hour? Someone said maybe you're working out or you're trying to get your liquid in. Oh, so I might have a plan for that. Yeah, so this is why you all are using those prefrontal cortexes. Nice work. Third thing that the prefrontal cortex does for you. So the first one was, whoa, control impulses. The second one was be logical and reasonable and think things through, reach a conclusion that makes sense. The third one, make choices. Decide, make a decision that's consistent with your values. So make a choice, decide. So the ability to decide something, 
to choose is handled by the prefrontal cortex. So Rachel, ask me, ask me a question. Hey, Tifa. Yeah. What are you going to fix for dinner? For dinner? For dinner. Hmm. Well, what do you want? Oh, I don't know. Like, I don't know. You want to do fish or soup? Well, I don't have any fish. No fish? Nope. How about soup? Are you fixing it? I could. Well, what kind are you going to fix? Well, do you like chicken? Do I like what? Chicken soup. Chicken soup. I don't know. What are you going to, what do you want? So when, <laughs> okay, so when it starts to feel like, just pick, or I want fish soup. And you're like, you don't even like fish. So when I make decisions either very impulsively or I can't seem to make decisions, I can't choose, I just, I get stuck, I don't know what to do, that speaks to problems in the prefrontal cortex. I'm having trouble with decision making. And a mature adult usually, if they're intact and they're in good shape, can, can choose between five to eight alternatives. And then if we get a little stressed, we can pick from among three options and then it's either or, and then I, I don't care, just do whatever you want because I get to a place where I can't decide or my decision doesn't make sense. Now, not normal means I'm not doing it the way I used to. Dementia means when you look at my decision making, it just seems like I just either can't decide I'm really stuck on deciding things or my decisions are so not what I've always done that you're just like, Ooh, what is going on here? But understand it's not going to be static. It could be sometimes and sometimes not. So now all of a sudden I, I'm not going to do that anymore. So I'm a person who's always been very much into health and wellness. And suddenly I'm eating bags of cookies and ho-hos and I'm not eating regular meals. And if you complain about it, it's none of your business. I can do whatever I want. I, you know, what am I supposed to do? I'm, I, you know, it doesn't matter anyway. Now, what I just described could be dementia or it could be depression. It's a little tricky here. Or it could be dementia plus depression. And that's why having a health provider who's really skilled and knowledgeable can come in really handy because these things are not just always straightforward. So let's go to the fourth thing that the front of your brain helps you with and runs for you. So when you make a decision, after you make the decision, what happens next? So I want to make soup for dinner. What has to happen? It turns out I have to initiate. I have to get started. I have to sequence. I have to do the steps that need to be done so that I finish. We have soup. And then when I finish fixing the soup, I move on to the next activity, which is set the table. I initiate setting the table. I get the soup on the table and then I finish that and I say, let's go eat dinner and I invite everybody to eat. And, and so we go from activity to activity and every one of them involves initiation, sequencing, finishing, and then moving on to the next thing. Get started, do it right, finish it off, and move on. So if I'm starting to notice that somebody either doesn't initiate, they're just not doing anything, they're sitting in the chair, they say they're going to do something, but nothing happens. They say they're going to get up, they don't get up. They say they're going to take a shower, they don't take a shower. They say they're going to change their clothes, they say they're going to go and do something with the advanced directives, they say they're going to do it, and they don't do it. That signifies I've got something going on in the prefrontal. Or when I go to do something, I'm not doing it right. So rather than adding sugar, I'm adding salt. Rather than doing all the steps in baking the cake, I never turn the oven on. I turn the oven on and I forget to turn it off at the end. I put soup in the pot, I put it on, and then I walk away to go take a phone call 
because I never finished that sequence before I went to something else. So this initiate, sequence, terminate, and then transition, go on to something else, is one of the areas that frequently we'll notice, wow, what is going on here? She is making, what is she doing? That's where we might notice some early signs of something not right. But if you point it out by pointing out the flaws, what you'll end up often with is an argument or a sense of distress, rather than being curious, huh? So she went to make soup and she never put anything in the pot, the pot burned. And what I also noticed is when that happened, she didn't worry about it. So there's a judgment problem in addition. And she got really angry when I said something about it. <laughs> it's like, whoa, what is going on here? It's a combination. But if we look at the prefrontal cortex realizing, wow, this is an area that's the last part of your brain to develop. Children don't have a very active prefrontal cortex. They won't get that until their teenage years and even young adulthood is when we develop that. And males are a little slower to develop in that area than females. It's true. I'm just saying, don't get upset. It's just real. They get there, it's just slower. Well, some people never fully develop their prefrontal cortexes. Some of them you know. So fifth skill in the prefrontal cortex, and this one is actually really important, and it's actually in a small part of your brain. It's a very small section of brain. Look at yourself in the mirror. Like imagine you're looking at yourself in the mirror and admire yourself, talent and skill. I'm good at some things. And it's good you think that because you should be. It's good. But then look at yourself and go, yeah, some things I'm not so good at. Yeah. Mostly we base it on what's happened in our past. So things we've had be happened before, we, we have a sense of whether I'm good at something or not. But now what I want you to do is look at yourself and look at yourself in this situation where you are right now and you have to decide, do, am I good at this or do I need help? Do I think I can handle this or do I think I'm gonna need assistance? And it's called self-awareness and how accurate I am. And it turns out that about half of everybody who gets dementia is not accurate in self-awareness. They think they're fine when they actually need assistance and they think they need assistance when they're fine. Please, I've got to have help. TB, you can do this. No, I can't. I'm going to fall. So it could go either way. Either I think I need help when I don't, or I think I don't need help when I actually do need help. And the term when you're inaccurate is called anisognosia, the inability to be self-aware. And it's one of the hallmarks for about half of everybody who gets dementia. They tend to underestimate or overestimate. And it makes it hard to provide the right support because they're not seeing things at all the way we're seeing. And it's not denial, it's actually brain failure. Now, 50% of people do have awareness, but that awareness can be really scary and it can be really um, distressing. And so what we might see is even though I have awareness, I may not want you involved. I may not want it shared. I may not want other people to know it. Or I may have awareness and I'm really aware, um, but people could take advantage of that. So this isn't like either way is better. It's just important to understand. Notice whether somebody seems to have self-awareness or whether they don't, because we want to modify how we help based on what they can do. Now, the last skill in the prefrontal cortex is the ability to see another person's point of view and figure out how to support them and get their point of view and understand why they're doing it and be able to work with them. So unfortunately for many people, that's one of the first skills that can get lost with this. So if we look at this part of the brain and you think about those six things, impulse control, being logical and reasonable, being able to make good choices and decisions based on values, being able to get started, do something the way you know you to do it, finish it off and then move on and do something. I mean, just being able to get through life and then being accurate in your self-awareness, I need help or I'm good to go. And then being able to see other people's points of view. How many situations do we run across, do you think, where those changes in brain function are causing a lot of frustration on both people's parts because what I expect to have happen to a mature, for a mature adult, you're just, 
mom, that doesn't make any sense. Rachel, what are you talking about? I mean, we get real flustered and yet all it is is a symptom of the disease. So I'm gonna pause there for a second to see if anybody has any specific questions. Now this is the front part of the brain. And unfortunately, most dementias have trouble with the prefrontal cortex fairly early in the disease, but it comes and it goes, it happens and then it doesn't. So I'll pause there just to see if anybody has any specific questions on that one. Yeah, but we did have one, uh, somebody asked, do you still respect the person by asking or you, do you just do it for them when you ask them, they just say, I don't know, whatever you want is okay, I don't care. Yeah. So if I say, hey, Rachel, would you rather have something hot or cold to drink? And you whatever. Say, whatever. How about if we try something hot and you can let me know what you think of it after you try it? Let's okay. Try. Come on. So are you liking the hot or would you rather have something cold? It's fine. It's fine. Okay. Cheers. So in that case, when the person really is struggling to make decisions, what I'll do is I often present the options and say, how about we try this? And then when they've tried it, sometimes when they have the sensory experience, then they can choose. Yeah, I like that or Ugh, this wasn't, I don't like this. If they're still going along, then I'm going to let it go, but I'll say, well, cheers, because what I want them to do is drink whatever it is. I don't care which we drink. We just need to make sure you get hydrated. And one of the realities is when you can't make decisions, frequently you become inactive because you get immobilized because you can't make choices and you don't know how to get started then. And so if they really don't seem to care, they may be somebody who cares more about being connected than being right or picking something for yourself, as long as you're okay with it. I just want to make sure I'm still using language and I'm still offering things. And I still, how about we try this? Because I want to form a partnership because if I start taking over everything, what can happen is she has nothing to do. And then pretty soon I'm feeling overwhelmed and she's not doing much because I haven't figured out how to engage. It's tricky though. Anything else, Rachel, before I move on? Um, there are lots of other things, but I think maybe you should go on. Okay, cool. Now take your fingers and put them at your temples, like you're pushing right into your temples, and then tip your hands upwards so your fingers are pointing down. Now I'm going to tell you, if you were to take your right finger, just your right, not your left, just your right, and you were to shove it about an inch, I don't want you doing that, but if you'd shove in about an inch, you would hit this area in the human brain. So your finger would be right outside here. This is your left, this is your right temporal lobe. This area deep inside is called the hippocampus. And you have one on each side. This is your right hippocampal area. And it has three jobs. It helps you learn new things and remember what you learn. Learn new things and remember what you learn. It also helps you find your way Go from here to there, and then turn around and come back. Go from here to the grocery store, to the gas station, and come back to your house. Go to church and the grocery store and come back home. So it allows me to go from place to place. It allows me to go from the living room to the bathroom, to the kitchen, back to the living room. So it allows me to find my way. It also helps me keep up, tap your wrist, how much time has gone by since? How long has it been since? So it helps you keep up with time. How long has it been since I slept? How long has it been since I ate? How long has it been since I went to the bathroom? How long has it been since I've seen a good friend? How long has it been since I was 15 years old? How long since? And so, if you notice what happens to this chunk of brain, take a look at all the wiring in this area, in that narrow passage out, it's this little triangle in here, and all this storage unit, all this storage, take a look at what's left by the end. What do you notice is really different? 
What's happened? He said flattened in a big hole, disconnected, very little connectivity. It's gone. Looks yeah, completely deteriorated. Yeah, look at all that wiring. Oh my heavens, look at this massive amount of wiring. And if you notice, it's about this trunk of brain now is only one third the size that it was originally was. This is the what's called a ventricle. This is the little bit of space where you have fluid in your brain that cleans your brain. Look at how big that hole has gotten. And this thing that we're calling, we're looking at is called atrophy. So it's your brain being destroyed by a form of dementia. So Rachel, what a, what are we gonna have what are we gonna have for tonight? For dinner? For yeah, I think. To eat or something else? To treat it? No, I don't need to, to treat eat. It. To eat. Oh to eat. Yeah, to eat. Yeah, to eat. Yeah. You hungry or thirsty? I don't know. You don't know? Hey, Tipa. Yeah. Drink? Oh. Oh, a, a, a what? Drink? Drink? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, drink. Write down. Look, look, look down. Yeah. You see purple? Purple, purple, yeah. Yeah, pick it up. Pick it, pick it up, here. There you go, I cheers. Cheers. Do, you, do, do I drink it? Drink it, yeah. Okay. Now I'm gonna pause because I was, I was simulating someone who's pretty far along in dementia or has a particular type of dementia that robs you of the ability to connect information. So what did you notice Rachel did to support me? Because part of how I live will now depend on Rachel. I can't be independent anymore. I can't remember things. I don't learn new things well, but I know whether or not I like Rachel. I do know whether or not I trust Rachel in this moment. I know whether or not I want to be with Rachel. And what I can do frequently is copy Rachel but I don't understand a lot of what Rachel says to me. And I couldn't even for sure know that when I pick this up, I should do this until Rachel showed me. Will I be able to you think, find the bathroom on my own? Will I plan enough time that I can get there before I need to use the bathroom? Will I be noticing so many things about myself, like, oh, my bladder is getting really full. I had that full, I've, I've had almost all this water in the last two hours. Boy, that's a lot of logical thinking, paying attention to data, and being able to then remember and keep up with time, and then find my way to the space and the place that I need to find. So. By late in this disease, is it now pretty clear why somebody's not going to be able to be independent and is going to need pretty much 24 7 guidance or assistance? Now, it's not like when I'm asleep, I need you right over top of me, but I may need you to be close by because I could sleep maybe an hour and I think I slept all night. And so I'm getting up, but I'm not safe because I don't have good balance and coordination. Oh boy. Now, here's another part of the brain. And this part of your brain, put your hand, heels of your hands to your temples. And now take your right one and put it down for a minute because what we're looking at is your left temporal lobe. And we haven't cut into it too much. We just took it away from the rest of your brain. So this is where it connects to the other parts of your brain that hippocampal kind of areas in this mix here. But this area right here, this chunk of brain that used to look like this, it used to be fat and juicy and full of tissue. This is all that's left of it. This whole section over here is now reduced to just this. 
This is where you have vocabulary, the words, comprehension, ability to understand the words, and speech production, the ability to say the words. So vocabulary, words, comprehension, ability to get the words and understand them, and then the ability to say the words, produce them. And this is how much of your brain was devoted to that, and this is how much you have left at the end of, of just about every dementia that there is. So I'm gonna pause there for a second and I'm wondering what you're thinking as you look at the change in language capacity. As you think about that and look at that, what does that make you think and, and what's your reaction to that with your happy little prefrontal cortexes and your visual skills? What are you thinking? If somebody asked when the person died, could they speak at all? It's interesting because there's a little tiny bit of tissue left. Occasionally, some people can. Sometimes it's only a word. Sometimes it might be a whole sentence. Interestingly enough, there are sustained skills, which I'm going to show you in a second. Any other feedback for us? So, if not, I'm gonna show you this part of the brain. These are still in the temporal lobes. This is the, the left temporal lobe. This chunk of tissue up here, what do you notice about it? This is sort of interesting. This is the one part of the brain that we don't see a lot of destruction of brain tissue. What do you notice about it? Look at the size of it over here and then look at the size of it over here. What's interesting? Didn't really change, did it? That's your ability to hear sound. So the brain's ability to hear sound is actually not affected by the disease. The wiring across the middle of the brain is affected. So I can't tell where the sound is coming from and I don't know what the sound means, but I still hear as well as I ever heard. Now, if I had a hearing problem before I got dementia or I develop a hearing problem, that's not my dementia. I can hear really well, so sometimes, shut up, quit yelling at me. It's too loud, get me out of here. I can get overwhelmed by sound. And I don't always know which conversation is meant for me and who's talking to whom in a group. And so sometimes in a larger group, I can't take it anymore. Sometimes when the environment gets sort of busy, I get overwhelmed. Sometimes I misunderstand and think the TV is, is a conversation I'm supposed to be having with someone. Sometimes I hear someone else's conversation and think I'm supposed to be involved in it. Sometimes I miss information, not because of hearing, but because of attention, because I have a hard time paying attention, because I can't tell what's supposed to be mine and what's supposed to be somebody else's. So restaurants can be a really frustrating place for somebody living with dementia because there's foreground noise and background noise. And people living with dementia have a hard time sorting it out. So sometimes they just get anxious, depressed, or angry, and they want to get out. I'm not, I don't want to stay here anymore. I don't, I don't want to go. Or they can really enjoy it, but they don't spend much time eating because they're socializing because it's taking everything they have to be social. So now what we're going to do is take a cut from top to bottom, slice right down through top to bottom. If you look at this part of your brain, up at the top is the map of your body on the brain map of your body and it's sensation in and movement out sensation in and movement out so if you look at that red oval and you look at the one down below what do you sensation in and movement out what does that tell you about the person's ability to move and know what's going on all over their body from the very beginning when they don't have dementia to the very end when they have a lot of dementia what does that tell you when you look at the brain and you're starting to understand white matter and gray matter? What are you thinking? Jennifer just said, wow, it's like nothing is left of the lower one. <sighs> yeah. So if you look at the little ventricles, look at how huge they are. Remember when I said your brain is down to one third its original size? And I said it shrinks from the inside and the outside. This is the inside shrinking. 
and that wiring, this is one side of your body talking to the other. This is also your body and your brain communicating with each other, which is why I can fall, break a hip, and I might be able to walk on it. You would not be able to walk on a broken hip. I could. I might not understand what's going on, but I might not like how something feels, and yet I keep doing something, and it's not good for me to do it, but I just like the movement. I like that movement. And so I may do it over and over, including trying to get up to move when I'm not safe to move because I don't have good balance. There are also parts of my body that stay really sensitive and some parts of my body I hardly am aware of. Where it stays really sensitive is right around here, right around the tip of my nose, my lips, the front of my mouth. The tips of these three fingers stay pretty sensitive, but the other parts of me, I may not, ooh, armpits can be really sensitive. Genitalia and in my groin, oh, oh, ow. And the toes and the sole, front sole part of my feet can be really sensitive. Heels, not so much. So there are some parts of my body I might hurt and not even notice. I can run into things. I can throw my arm out and not realize I've hurt myself. And yet I can be very interested at picking at things or messing with things. And so you see me doing these things and you're thinking, oh my gosh. And you try to use logic and language to get me to stop rather than go, huh. So I wonder what would happen if I put a lot of lotion on and then took a sports sock, turned it outside, inside out, and put it on and gave her something to pick at, like a men's sports or a tube sock. And now I've got all these little things I can pick at and pick at. And by putting lotion on, it keeps my skin from having the hairs move so much. So there's all kinds of ways once we start recognizing, wow, they do what they do because of a combination of what's missing and what's still there. So I like to do things with my fingers, but I'm not necessarily aware that what I'm doing is risky or dangerous or problematic. Now, you remember that vocabulary comprehension speech production? That's your orange circle. Look at all that wiring and storage. Remember when we were looking at the outside? This is what it looks like on the inside. And this bottom one, that's all that's left. That's all we have, that little tiny bit. And what that means is if I say to you, stand up and come with me, not a lot going on there because I'm missing some wiring, especially trying to get your body to do what I just asked it to. On the other hand, this place over here in the right-hand side of the brain, the right temporal lobe, that's where rhythm is. That's where all the rhythm-related stuff is. And so forbidden words are over there. Every forbidden word you've ever learned, swear words, sex talk, racial, cultural slurs, ugly words, shut up, you're an idiot, you fat pig. All those things are still going to be stored over there because we kept them out of the regular vocabulary section. We didn't want them in regular vocabulary. We put them over here in this when you're upset, when you're scared, when you're angry, when something surprises you. <gasps> yeah, they're still there. Now, with lack of impulse control and lack of other vocabulary, you may hear more of them from somebody who you would never have heard that before. The second thing, however, is that you will also hear back and forth, back and forth, chit chat. People can often chit chat or do a little simple conversation and even a back and forth, as long as it's turn taking, they can sometimes keep up with that or arguing. Arguing is also a preserved skill because it's, no, I didn't, yes, you did. No, I did not, yes, you did. Back and forth, back and forth, y'all been there. Then we have the rhythm of speech, both the rhythm, but also the rhythm of a question, tone of voice. Those kind of things. So what we know is if there's a change in frequency, intensity, or volume, it indicates distress. Or frequency, intensity, whoa, 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 please, please, please. So we're really good at using rhythm to signal I need help or no, 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 signal I don't want something. So not so much the exact words, but how I say the words, but also how you say things to me. I can pick up on. I may not get the words, but I got the attitude. So you go, ah, 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 sit down. Well, unless I'm real compliant, guess what I'm going to do? <laughs> sit 
sitting down. You're not the boss of me. So recognizing, wow, man, that chunk of brain is damaged, but it still works a whole lot better than the other one. And then what we have is the gift and the blessing in this area. Music, poetry, prayer, and counting. Music, poetry, prayer, and counting tend to be preserved. Some aspect of that. Music, poetry, prayer, and or counting. It's very common for somebody living with dementia to still have some of those abilities. And so it means that if I use what they have, sometimes I stir the pot and they are actually pretty skillful at some stuff. And then the very last thing is automatic rhythmic movement. So people can often rock or hum or dance better than they can do a planned action. So important to have a handle on. So the final part of the brain I'm going to show you is the back part. And this is where vision is. Now, what happens with dementia is your vision field collapses down. It goes from here to here to here to here. And then it's just hard for me to stay focused externally. So how much data I can take in, but also how quickly I pick up on things. Visual field, but also depth perception will be affected. My ability to notice objects, my ability to recognize and how, know how to use objects will be affected. So what does that mean? Well, what did Rachel do when she wanted me to take a drink? What'd she do to help me? She showed me, she demonstrated. She might also do some things where she might actually use her hand with my hand if we were together. So I'm gonna pause here because we are, believe it or not, we're almost out of time. And I could spend more time, we could talk some more because there's more to learn about dementia for sure. But why do they do what they do? Well, because their brains are dying. Why do they do what they do? Well, because some parts of the brain still work. Why do they do what they do? Well, because what we do makes a difference. And sometimes we wanna change the environment and sometimes we need to think about how we're spending time. And sometimes we need to be flexible because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So we're gonna open it up for some questions because we have a few minutes that we have for questions. So I'm gonna turn it over for just a second here to Kelly to see so she can field some of these questions. Yep. Um, one of them is, why does my loved one regularly do the opposite? I asked if he could put a foot and he presses hard into the ground or let go of this and he holds it tighter. Yeah. So one of the things that can happen is if I say what I want you to do is let go of something and I try to take it away, <laughs> what I've just done is I've double messaged you because I said let go, but what I when I gave it a little pull, Movement in your hand stimulates what's called a grasp reflex. So if I do anything to try to get him to, and I'm touching it, what I'm saying is this is a really good thing. And then the person is going, yeah, and it's mine. <laughs> so if you instead go, hey, Rachel, here you go. And I offer her something else when she has something in her hand and notice my hand is down that she could lay her thing down and I'm going to give her this. It's called the artist substitution, not subtraction. So we also want to think about if they, I say, pick up your foot and they're pushing down. I automatically, because of my background, I automatically start thinking Lewy body disease because Lewy body has a has a feature where when I want to do something with my body, opposite is what actually happens. <laughs> it's like, ah, how can, you know, when I say pick your foot up, he pushes it to the floor. It's the miswiring and Louie body gets deep inside the brain and affects the wiring in a major way. And then five minutes later, it's fine. And it's like, ah, <laughs> give me a break. Do you have any suggestions for her? She says it's the same person who has trouble with undressing. Yeah. So one of the things to think about doing is breaking it down into small pieces. And rather than making so many verbal requests, sort of going, here you go, and show him a new shirt, but not within hands reach, and then say, right here. 
And I will say that fine motor dexterity is one of the first skills bilateral is one of the hardest things for people with Lewy body often to be able to do, particularly on themselves where they can't actually see well what they're doing. So we have a technique called hand under hand to get started. And usually you only have to do the first button with their hands underneath. So you actually, your hands underneath theirs and your fingers are doing it, but their hands are laying on top. And so you do a button and then all of a sudden their brain goes, oh, I know this. And it just continues on its way and finishes it off. But you may want to think about uh, getting up with us. We do have some videos that we have of how to support people, particularly with Lewy body, because it is a unique dementia, saying the least. <laughs> uh, my mother has become paranoid and thinks her caregivers and I are stealing her money, her purse. She also hides things, including the remote and other items. Is this typical? Yeah, because what happens is I'm afraid people will take stuff. So what do I do when I'm afraid people will take stuff? I hide stuff. Why do I hide stuff? Because I want people to take stuff. What do I forget? Where I hid it. So when I can't find the thing I was looking for, guess what happened? Somebody hid it. It wasn't me, because I would remember if I hid it, I didn't, somebody came in here and took it. So what we want to start thinking about is a couple of things. Number one, do we need a monitoring system so we can observe where she might put it? But when I do go to looking for it, I said, oh, so your remote is missing. Well, that's not good. So, oh, you're afraid one of us took your, ah, so one, somebody came in and took your purse. That's not all right. That shouldn't be happening. Oh, tell you what, before we call the police, I'm wondering if I should look around and see if maybe somebody put it up. Maybe they hid it somewhere. Can I, can I take a look? real quick before we make a call because I don't want to make a call and then find out it was actually hidden away somewhere. Well, you could look, but I don't think you're going to find it. So what we want to be responsible for is thinking, hmm, immediate recall problems, fear of others taking things. This is a person who wants to be in control, needs to be in control, is fearing loss of control and can't keep up with what just happened and what's happened recently. So that's someone that more important than ever that we start to establish a sense of she needs to be in control. If we try to get her to understand that we didn't take it, she must have hit it, all we do is make her not trust us more. <laughs> and it's really hard sometimes. <laughs> ah! So we may actually want to think about, wow, so somebody took your purse. I hate that. So now tell you what, let's so tell me more about it. Tell me more about it invites them to talk about it. And although that's probably the last thing you want to do, letting them talk about the missing thing and then saying, tell you what, let's take a look around here before we make a phone call, just in case. And if we find it, nobody says, I told you you hit it. <laughs> you got to let go of it. And you got to say, oh, good. I am so glad we came across it. Man. But it takes practice. And it takes actually some skill development. And unfortunately, guess what? People don't get trained when they get the diagnosis. They just get the diagnosis. Um, but we're beginning to understand how important it is for family members and staff to get the training, deep training that they need when somebody's living with dementia. And a lot of our art and courts facilities are vir uh, doing virtual dementia support groups. So you can meet other caregivers who have faced similar challenges and get what time-tested uh, tips they might have. Uh, our communities also deal with similar issues with our residents and they can lend a little help too. But I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I do want to add that a few days after the webinar, we will send an email to all the registrants with the link for the webinar. Uh, Tipa Snow does have an event that she does virtually called Ask Tipa. I think it's Wednesdays at eight o'clock, but if, I, if I'm right. Um, but I will also put information about that when we email everybody too. So um, if you have additional questions that we didn't get to today, that maybe you could ask them on one of the Wednesday sessions. So but I want to thank Tifa and Rachel for helping a lot of people today. Everybody who's out there in the cyber world, I hope you stay healthy until the next time that we see you. Uh, uh, I learned a ton of information today and I just, I think we helped a lot of people. Thank you so much. You guys are so welcome. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Stay healthy. Bye.